so those were the th were, were the three main reference points uh, for how I originally imagined this book. Now, once I started to write the book, which was actually in the mid 1980s, I, I conceived it in the mid 80s. I didn't really start writing it until. Uh, the early to middle uh, 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 1990s. But between the mid 1980s and the mid 1990s, two other considerations became equally important. The first of these uh, concerns the fundamental definition of the left. The fundamental definition of the left. What is the left encompass? Now, most histories tacitly identify the left with socialism. And it was really important to my own purposes, in contrast, that I took a much, much broader and more generous view of what the left can be taken to include. Now, this was crucial to the politics behind the book. My goal was to define the left very capaciously in relation to the politics of democratic advocacy, in relation to the politics of democratic advocacy. Now, I, I took as my criteria the types of politics, practices, ideas, and movements that secured or expanded democratic capacities in the various societies and periods between the mid-19th century and the present. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that again. My criteria for, you know, for redefining the left in these ways were the types of politics, practices, ideas, and movements that secured or expanded democratic capacities in the various societies and periods between the mid-19th century and the present. Now, by not confining my account to the histories of the socialist and communist parties and the other strands of the socialist tradition, I wanted to free discussion for a more complicated understanding of how democratic gains actually occur, or usually occur. I wanted to broaden our understanding of the left's boundaries outwards by drawing attention to everything the socialist tradition failed to accomplish and indeed proved extremely ill-equipped to pursue. So there's a double purpose involved in this book, if you like. On the one hand, I wanted to honor the tradition, you know, in, in complicated and uh, nuanced and careful and critical ways, but I certainly wanted to honor the tradition. But I also wanted to be, you know, very candid and, uh, you know, equally searching about what it couldn't do, what it failed to do, and what it, in many respects it couldn't do. For instance, you know, and this is just a list of the things that, you know, uh, that uh, would fall on in, in that category. Already before, before 1914, agrarian politics in the interests of the peasantry, questions of ethnicity, colonialism, and nationalist identification, issues of sexuality, family relations, and intimate life, questions of uh, social morality and religious belief, and the entire domain of gendered social and cultural differences. Now, it wasn't that the left, you know, kind of had nothing to say about those things before 1914 or subsequently in the early 20th century, but its, its ability to address those questions was always subject to a, a severe limitations and, uh, and really difficult impediments, okay? Now, once we define the left by the broader criteria of democracy in, in this way, and it seems to me that any, you know, kind of principled Democrat who wants to, you know, claim the sort of the ground of the left has to have an answer for each of the questions that I just mentioned, okay? Now, once we define the left by the broader criteria of democracy in this way, in other words, rather than by socialism in the more classical senses, the historical failings of the left become every bit as, imp as important as its strengths. If at one level my definition becomes more inclusive, therefore, at another I buy democracy, at another level it uh, draws our attention to what the left has tended to leave out. With respect to the situation of women, to take one of the um, more obvious examples, 
Decisive changes had to wait until the last third of the 20th century and the remarkable regendering of political subjectivities that accompanied the fallout from the upheavals of 1968. I, I, I'm not claiming that 1968 somehow, you know, kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of re was responsible in some direct sense of authorship for the new feminisms, but it seems to me that the the the, the new feminisms um, are, are impossible to understand without the fallout. Okay, without the fallout from the upheavals of 1968, writing a gendered history of the left to take account of these arguments was a very important part of what I wanted to accomplish. So this question of definition, the question of how best to define the boundaries of the left, was the first of the new problems that I tried to sort through once I started actually to write the book. So my big question was, how was democracy produced and secured in Europe between 1850 and now? And how um, were the most decisive breakthroughs to democracy achieved. Now the second new problem was that precisely as I started to write the book, the socialist and communist traditions entered what in many respects has turned out to be a terminal crisis. In other words, I found that I was writing my book in the midst of a profoundly important contemporary transition in which one established mode of left politics was coming to an end and a new one had not yet come properly into being. You know, and, and some of you may recognize that as a, you know, an adaptation of a famous adage by Antonio Gramsci. Because in that transition, all sorts of morbid symptoms appear, was the other part of the quotation. Now, in that recognition, in that recognition, I set out to explore the sites and forms through which the left might, in the future, begin to be rebuilt. So to explore the sites and the conditions and the forms through which the left might, in the future, begin to be rebuilt. And my, my answer to this question, you know, to this, you know, this bringing, you know, the, the previous century between, uh, you know, the 1860s and the 1960s and the 1980s into under critical review, my answer is that between the 1860s and the 1960s, between the 1860s and the 1960s, the main vehicle or agency of democratic political change was provided by the socialist political tradition, but that secondly, as a result of a complicated process of change since the 1960s, that leading political role of the socialist tradition as it was known has come to an end. So what I argued in the book was that for roughly a hundred years, for roughly a century, between the 1860s and the 1960s, the socialist tradition exercised a long-lasting hegemony over the left's effective presence in Europe. The socialist tradition hegemonized the politics of democracy. The socialist tradition had hegemonized the politics of democracy. Socialist and communist parties provided the backbone of movements for democracy pioneering democ uh, democracy's earliest forms, rallying to their defense, and pushing the boundaries forward. Part of their strength in this period was to be able very successfully to rally other constituencies and advocates of, de uh, advocates of democracy around themselves. Democracy achieved its greatest gains in Europe when the socialist parties managed to broaden their politics outwards from the class political center ground, magnetizing larger progressive coalitions around the labor movement's central agency. Between the mid 19th century and the 1960s, socialist parties could never carry their goals alone. 
I mean, they never, in, in elections, uh, and obviously there are more ways than elections for gauging this, but in elections between the late 19th century and the 1960s, socialist parties or communist parties, even in combination, have very rarely managed a percentage of the popular electoral vote of much more than 37%. Okay? So, in that century, socialist parties could never carry their goals alone. They always needed allies. But if the left was always larger than socialism in that sense, socialist parties always remained, during that century, at the indispensable core. Two dimensions to this larger coalition building. One was the making of alliances with other parties and organized progressive groupings. But the other was the creation of powerful synergies between parties and social movements. Genuine and sustained democratization has always entailed popular mobilizations of unusual intensity and scale. Those popular mobilizations <coughs> have been possible only in the midst of severe social and economic conflicts, breakdowns of government, and crises of the whole society. Established political mechanisms, parliamentary process and the associated proceduralism, consensus building, the rules of, civil of civility, established political mechanisms in those ways tend to have broken down. Any significant gains, any significant gains for democracy, whether in 1968 or 1989, or in a variety of national cases like Hungary and Poland in 1956, Portugal in 1974, Spain in the mid-1970s, Poland in 1980-81, any significant gains for democracy always presupposed a general societal crisis and associated political breakdowns of that kind. In any of the great democracy-expanding moments of European history, I would argue, the politics of parliaments and committee rooms have always been reinforced by the politics of the factories, the workplaces, and the streets. Now this dialectic between parliamentary and extra-parliamentary political arenas between, between parliamentary and extra-parliamentary arenas of politics has always been absolutely crucial to the effectiveness of the left, to the political efficacy of the left. And it's precisely this area, it's precisely uh, in this area that the most momentous changes of the last 30 years have taken place, it seems to me. Now, between the early 1900s, when socialist parties first began achieving significant electoral success, and the 1970s, when the first strong signs of their disintegration became clear, socialist and communist parties proved themselves incredibly effective vehicles for organizing the wider democratic synergies that I've just been describing. That's what I mean by this socialist hegemonizing of the democratic of democratic possibilities so between the early 1900s when socialist parties first began achieving their significant electoral breakthroughs in in europe and the 1970s when the first signs that they were falling apart started to appear socialist and communist parties proved themselves extraordinarily effective vehicles for organizing the wider democratic synergies that I've been describing. But it com becomes more and more clear from our contemporary vantage point that the socialist political tradition as we have known it now has to be historicized 
you know, located in a very particular set of historical circumstances, now has to be historicized to a very particular and finite period between the last quarter of the 19th century, uh, when the socialist parties were founded in Europe, country by country, and the 1960s, when their given structures started to fall apart. The socialist tradition in that period had been shaped by a very particular set of social and political histories. It was shaped by definite social histories of industrialization and the associated large urban concentrations of working class population. So it was, it was shaped by capitalist industrialization and associated processes of working class formation and those urban concentrations of the working class were also residentially segregated so that they developed distinctive forms of community solidarity. They were also organized within distinctive frameworks of municipal government, local government, city-based government, based in control of public employment and the delivery of social services. Last but not least, they were also, also shaped um, over time uh, by uh, a politics coordinated by the labor movement. Now this, uh, so, so in other words, the socialist tradition that I, uh, you know, th that was capable of hegemonizing the politics of democracy in that, s that century that I've been describing was located, you know, was located, was lo located and produced by this combination of circumstances. Capitalist industrialization and large concentrations of urban working class and particular structures of local government. 